Hello, beautiful people. In today's episode, I'm joined by Madison Fisher, and Madison is absolutely brilliant. She started rock climbing when she was 11 years old. She's represented in Canada now in four continents, both as a youth competitor and as now an open climber. She has her sights on the Olympics, which we discussed in this conversation, but in addition to rock climbing, she's also an incredible, incredible writer. I actually have Ryan Stevens to thank for this introduction, which you could find episode 13, Ryan Stevens. Thank you so much. He highlighted Madison in his newsletter, and he highlighted her social media free stint, which we began this conversation talking about. And then after researching her, I find out she's 19 years old, which absolutely blew my mind. This was an incredible conversation. I am so fortunate to have spoke to Madison and learned from her, and I think you really will as well. For those new here, I release new episodes Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Thank you so much for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, let me know on Twitter, at HeyDannyMiranda. And without further ado, let's get to it. Interesting people, thought-provoking conversations, nutrition for your brain. Journey through the minds of the world's top performers and discover what it really takes to achieve your highest version. This is the Danny Miranda Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm really good. Yeah, it's been, uh, it's about one o'clock, so I've had about half my day done already. Morning's usually the most, uh, Productive, but I'd say today wasn't quite as productive as most days, but doing good. (laughs) Well, that's good to hear. Um, So one of the reasons why I wanted to have you on this podcast is because you have such an interesting story from my perspective of being such a young person, but it seems from reading your website, such a wise person as well. And one of the things that you did was that I I have to make sure I talk to you about was you haven't used social media since 2018. Is that correct? Yeah. So talk a little bit about why you did that and and what went into that decision. For sure. Um, So I'll say, you know, going all the way back to the beginning here, um, I joined social media just like everyone else. You know, it's a very popular thing to do. Uh, I joined when I was in, I think it was elementary school. Um, And it was right when Instagram like first was becoming popular. So I was right at that age um, to get started with it. And I used it, you know, just as everyone else did, you know, you put your little posts on, you see, you know, you follow your friends and all that sort of stuff. Um, But shortly after I got it, I started rock climbing and I started rock climbing competitively. And my Instagram became something to record my, my achievements and my, you know, what, my, my progress in climbing as well. And people really, really liked looking at that and following that and, and, you know, seeing what I'm up to. So it was getting pretty popular. And as I did more and more in climbing, I uh, noticed that my social media presence was getting more and more um, of a like major part of my life. And it came to a point where um, social media was almost on par with you know, training and family time and all that sort of stuff. It was like a huge part of my life. And as an athlete, especially, it felt like it was part of the reason um, that sponsors were, um, you know, sponsoring me and people were paying attention to me. So it felt like something that couldn't be removed from my life. And the moment I thought that was the moment I realized it can't be in my life anymore. Like there can't be an, I can't be controlled by an app. Like an app is not allowed to tell me, whether I'm, you know, whether I should post and how often I should be on my phone, like, that's just not cool. Um, And in addition to that, I was noticing like the toll it was taking on my training, you know, having, you know, this constant, you know, background noise of just people are on my account right now, or people are commenting something, or I'm at a competition, and I'm, I'm constantly thinking about like what the photographers are doing, and if I'm going to get a good post for this weekend. And it was just distracting from what I'm really supposed to be doing. And that is being the best athlete I could possibly be. And so it took me quite a while uh, to kind of, you know, really get rid of it. 
Um, at first I just deleted it and tried to stay off, but I was so addicted to the dopamine hits of likes and follows and comments that, uh, I would just cheat and I would go and Google, you know, www.instagram.com and I would go on and check out my profile and see if there was anything to do. Um, so it took me about eight months, maybe nine to, you know, very slowly, take down my presence on social media. And this went for Facebook too and whatever other social media I had until I think it was November or December where I outright just deleted it and, uh, you know, deactivated my accounts. I haven't been on since. And I definitely, as soon as I deleted it, I realized how like free I was, you know, it felt really, really um, good to go to a competition and not even think about what other competitors are doing. Cause I didn't like, I didn't see them. I usually, you know, watch what they're doing on social media, check their stories. Are they at the airport? Are they already there? Are they training still? And, um, my first competition after I deleted it was, uh, open nationals. And that was to this day, one of the, if not the best competition I ever went to, because I was so focused on just the climbing part of the competition. And that's really what it used to be about before I got really popular on social media. And um, so deleting it was really bringing me back to like the early days when it was all about just doing as, as well as you possibly could at a competition. So um, I haven't been on since, and I'm very, very happy without it. There've been a couple speed bumps, but uh, overall, definitely one of the best decisions I made for my athletic career. Yeah, and I definitely want to touch on that in the future in a little bit more in the future of this episode, but talk a little bit about how you got into rock climbing because you know, you're young. I what are you 19 years old, is that correct? Yeah. And so you're 19, but I was looking you up online and and doing research for this conversation, and it's like you've been at this for a long time in terms of when you were 14 years old, there were stories being uh, written about you and and there was you know video coverage of you so talk a little bit about how you got into rock climbing and and then you started to excel and and like talk a little bit about your journey on that because I, I'm sure a lot of people listening would be will be very interested in that yeah it definitely feels like it's been quite a long time uh like again I'm only 19 but I've I think it's been like eight or nine years and you know when you're only 19, eight or nine years is actually like the majority of your life because you can't really remember like the early days up to six. So it's really it's really been like my whole life is this climbing. Um, so I think the first time I went to a climbing gym was just like the local climbing gym. They just opened, I think, a year before I joined their gym. And so really lucky that they happened to you know open a gym in my area. Otherwise, you know, who knows if I would have even uh, had this opportunity. Um, but it was actually my stepdad, one of his friends from work, I guess, brought him to the gym and he was absolutely hooked. And of course, when you're hooked, you want to get all your friends and family involved. So he, he tried to get the whole family involved. Um, I don't really remember this part quite so well, but he claims that I was very resistant to coming to the gym. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like it's because I didn't want him to be like better than me at the climbing. Cause he'd already had a couple months on me. Um, Plus, he was like a fully grown man, and I was like a <laughs> kid. Um, but yeah, I eventually did get out, and uh, yeah, like I was pretty good at it to be to be honest. Like starting out, it was it was a bit of a like a perfect match for me. Like I was a pretty competitive kid. I did a little bit of uh, like track and field kind of stuff, but never really anything consistently and um, really in depth. So. Uh, about a year after I started, I uh, joined the team. There were actually a bunch of kids already on the team that were like, you got to get on this team. Like you, you definitely got a talent for this thing. Like you really like competing. And uh, I hold, held off a little bit just to get a little bit better before I started. And then um, when I did, I'm obviously very glad I did. Um, and I've been competing ever since. So I think that was 2014 that I started competing. So, so what sticks out to me is like how you knew at such a young age, right? That like, this is what I want to be doing. Cause I'm thinking back to myself at that age and I was interested in tennis and then basketball and baseball. And I guess I never really excelled at any one of them, but the, I just, it amazes me that you, you said to yourself, you know what, this is what I'm going to do. This, this is perfect for me. And I want to ask, 
if it wasn't for rock climbing, what sport do you think you would play, if any? Yeah, um, I, I have given this quite a bit of thought, um, especially whenever I get injured. I always think, what sport could I pivot to? Like if I if I had to stop climbing right now because of this injury. Um, and lately, I've been really into like CrossFit, which, of course, mm-hmm. is like the number one sport for like injury because you're doing absolutely every movement in such a an interesting way. Um, but CrossFit, I really like the intensity and the the like grit of the whole sport. Mm-hmm. Um Oddly enough, I also really like Formula One. Uh, it's not really the most like traditionally athletic, athletic sport, but it's got such a an interesting like head game to it. Um, so probably one of those two. Although Formula One's pretty dangerous, so I don't know if I'm not that. I'm a bit of a scary scary cat, um, <laughs> which sucks when it's when I'm when I have to climb really high and you know have a little I have a touch of a fear of heights. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe one of those two. Very interesting. And I'm so happy you brought up CrossFit because you recommended to me a couple months back, I I emailed you for book recommendations when I saw that we had read so many of the same books. I was like, you have to have some books that I've never heard of or never read. And you, you gave two recommendations that absolutely blew me away. And one of those was a book that I read when I went on a digital detox for six days. And It was called Chasing Excellence by Ben Bergeron. And and the book was so perfect because it it explained the mindset of a champion, the mindset of this. The book is, for those who are unaware, it's it's Ben Bergeron's the coach for two different CrossFit champions in 2016, the male and female champion. And and he took us through their preparation and their, their mindset and the things they would do. And so... Talk a little bit about that book and why it made such a big impact on you. Yeah. So Matt Frazier, um, he's definitely his mind. Like it's not about what he's doing in the gym. It's about like how he's mentally preparing for competitions or what he's doing uh, with what he's reading or or writing down, um, which you don't traditionally think of when you think of like high level professional athletes. You think of, you know, double sessions every day and crazy diet but really the most important part of an athlete is their mind. And that's something that from my perspective, I can hundred percent control and work on to the best extent I possibly can. Like you don't need to have crazy genetics to work on your mind. Um, So it's always been something very, very achievable for me in my athletics. And uh, I really liked reading about that and chasing excellence because it gave me such motivation like I can become a champion. All I need to do, well, not all you need to do, but uh, a large part of it is just, you know, controlling and thinking. And uh, that part has really, really guided my um, my training ever since I read that book. Um, it, mental training was always a big part of my uh, my whole kind of athletic persona. But after reading that book, I absolutely doubled down on the importance, and I stressed it with the people I've been coaching and. Um, just, you know, at the house when I'm talking with my stepdad about uh, whatever we're training or whatever competitions are coming up, it always comes down to mental training. And chasing excellence was definitely what pushed me towards that and probably pushed me a little bit further in my uh, career as well. Love it. And so you mentioned the training aspect of it. I'm super curious what your training is actually like. What are you doing from Monday to Friday or Monday to, to Saturday or Sunday? What is like your schedule like and what are you you doing in the gym and what are you doing in your mind I know it's a a huge question I know you probably uh spend a lot of time thinking about every single day and and a lot goes into it but but give us give us something of of your training schedule and what it's like yeah I mean this is my absolute favorite topic or my favorite question because I'm just so like passionate about what I do and um not a lot of athletes don't have a coach. I don't actually really have an official coach. Um, so I'm the one making my own programs and, you know, designing my exercises and all that sort of stuff. So, and I love making schedules for some reason. So whenever I have to switch phases or there's a competition coming up, I'm always really excited to grab out the calendar and, and really, you know, plan out what I'm going to do. Um, so 
basically it's a, it's a day system. So it's Monday through to Wednesday. Um, those are all training days. They're all double sessions as well. So if I'm in strength phase, I'll do a climbing session and a like weightlifting kind of session. Um, one after the other, I usually have a couple hours in between to recover. Um, and then the middle day is always a different, um, exercise. So if I'm, if I'm lifting my upper body, I'll do that Monday and Wednesday, and then the lower body will be Tuesday just to kind of give it a break. Um, especially in climbing, you don't really need your lower body too much. So I don't do a lot of leg work. It's mostly pull-ups and rows. Uh, you just kind of need a strong back to, to do this thing. It's really pretty simple. Um, but it is quite a bit of work. Um, I'll say training your back is a lot of like resting and just trying to be as strong as possible and lift as much weight as possible. So it's not, it's never about reps. Like I'll, I'll do probably like three to five reps at a time and then break for like seven minutes to try to maximize the strength there. Um, I also do two days a week of just cardio general conditioning. So there's a hill actually, it's a couple, it's a city over. So it's about a 15 minute drive. Um, but I'll drive over there and I'll just jog around, um, for about half an hour and there's hills too. So it changes the intensity, um, here and there, which is, I really like it. It's kind of keeping things interesting. Um, cause the downhills are a bit of a break and then you have to go uphill and then you're all tired and then you walk it off. So it's, it's really interesting. I'm not much of a cardio person, so this is nice and it's decently short and it keeps me engaged. Um, I have one and a half rest days. So one is like a full rest day and that's on Thursday, um, which is today. <laughs> and, uh, Sundays, I just do the cardio. So I'm not on the wall. I'm not in the weight room. I'm just jogging outside. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. Just lifting, climbing, doing a little bit of the cardio. Um, and then of course there's the mental training, which always, uh, it usually happens at home. So a big part of my mental training is reading. So I'm always looking for those like mind blowing books as you described. Um, I think someone recommended Chris Hadfield's book, which is, uh, uh, he's an astronaut. He's a Canadian, Canadian astronaut. And he has a lot of really awesome insights about, I think in particular, the thing that really struck me was how improbable it is to become an astronaut. Like it's basically not going to happen, but if you want to be an astronaut, you need to look at the odds that are effectively zero and still think and convince yourself that you're going to do this which is something that needs to happen in athletics as well. Um, you need to think like not a lot of people become professional athletes. There's only a handful of champions in the world and it's going to be a lot of work and there's a good chance that it won't pay off in the end. But being an astronaut and being a professional athlete, you need to just push that aside. And um, so when I read that book, that was a big part of my mental training during that kind of time. It was about probably three weeks when I was just thinking about the odds and thinking about, you know, what's going to happen if I don't plan for failure and just pushing it all aside and trying to just focus on the goals and uh, focus on like the now. Yeah. What I loved about that book in particular, An Astronaut's Guide to Life on Earth, was that he had this goal when he was a young kid, like nine or 10 or, you know, really young kid. And there were no Canadians that were ever in space at that time. No Canadian could go to space. But he said to himself, okay, if I were to be an astronaut, what would I do? And and he started making those decisions at such a young age like, oh, I'm going to work out instead of uh, eat or I'm going to work out instead of watch TV. You know, like it started making these decisions. And when you do that over and over and over and over again and you have a – a decent amount of luck help you like that Canadians could go to space. I mean, it's just incredible what could happen and, and what the, the potential is. So yeah, that's super cool to see. And, and, uh, I love to hear how it, how it impact you. And so talk a little bit about just your, so you're reading books for your, your mental training. Do you do any types of visualization or, meditation. I'm curious about that as well. Yeah. So yeah, books are definitely the number one when it comes to mental training. Um, I do a lot of like notes and I have like a specific book that I like transfer over ideas that I think of when I'm reading. Um, but meditation is also a really big one. 
Um, it used to be a lot bigger, uh, like a couple years ago when I would do it every single day. Um, I used to actually, I got this from, uh, chasing excellence at one point where, uh, Matt may, or uh, not Matt, uh, Ben made, uh, Matt Frazier and Katrin just sit for 10 minutes before they started their workout. Um, just because, you know, you can't, you know, it's, it's really hard to just sit still for 10 minutes. <laughs> and actually I remember, uh, reading about your, uh, hour long meditations every day. And I was absolutely blown away by that. Like I find it very difficult. Um, especially when I want to start getting warmed up and I want to like get this, this whole session, you know, over with and just sitting even for 10 minutes, I find so difficult. Um, so I did that for quite a while. Um, and then I transferred over cause it kind of evolves as I, as I need it more, I need it less, um, at some times. And as you keep practicing, of course, like meditation becomes a part of what you do like every day. Like if I go to, you know, I get up from my desk after working for an hour, all of a sudden I have a very, um, like lucid moment where I'm, I'm just noticing the ground and I'm noticing, um, what I'm doing, like very, very aware of what I'm doing throughout the day. So, um, yeah, I used to practice it a lot more and these days I do it probably once or twice a week. And, uh, but every single day there's always like a meditation type moment. Um, and it happens in my training as well when I'm like in the middle of something like really tough. And I just have this, this, this real quick second where I just think, and I look beyond myself and I think, you know, you're pulling right now, you're pulling really, really hard, like keep going, you know, endure through this, you got this. Um, so that really helps. Um, and I usually try to do a guided meditation, um, which just is, is just helping me to get through, uh, and do like the, the busy work I'd say of meditation. Um, and it's a lot easier than just sitting with absolutely nothing. Um, which again, I find very, very difficult. Um, Otherwise, there's a lot of journaling as well. Um, I try to journal on the daily, just kind of going through the day. Uh, if there's ever something that's really impactful to happen, like a competition or a really important moment in training where I realize something, um, I'll definitely write that down. My workout journal is basically doubles as like a, a normal journal. Um, so not only do I write my sets, but if there's something to note, I'll always put a big long paragraph below my workout just kind of so that I don't forget what uh, – what I was thinking about when I was training that day. Um, Cause I always try to capture the mindsets that I have in training and put them towards competitions. Cause I find my training used to be not quite as good as my competitions. And now it's almost flipped where my training is better than my competitions. Mm -hmm. So I'm really working to even those out and uh, journaling during my sessions and after is really helping with that. Yeah. I found that it's so fascinating because one of the most common themes between the people who I talk to on this podcast is that they're journalers, that everyone is is journaling. And so one thing that, that leads me to ask is, you've been journaling for a while. What have been some of the takeaways and or mindset shifts that you've noticed over the years of, of journaling thus far? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so off the top of my head, I can definitely say I journal a lot about ego. Because when you're journaling, it's really, really personal. And you can you can be as honest as possible. It's just you reading it, right? Um, so I always write down when I have moments of, like, weakness, especially when it comes to ego. So I'll say, like, I remember one time I was at the gym and uh, a competitor of mine walked in. And I got super defensive because it was my – it was, like, my home gym. It was kind of my home turf. And someone else was coming in. And, you know, now all of a sudden I wasn't, like, the only – like female competitor at the gym. Cause right now I'm, there's not very many females, um, at the higher levels at my gym. So seeing someone else there almost makes me a bit territorial. And, um, so I got back that day and I just started journaling and I was like, why am I so territorial? And by the end of my page, I think it took like three or four pages for me to finally get to the root of like what I was feeling about, um, that interaction I had with that competitor. And, it, it like, honestly, from then on, I was really like, I'm, I'm a lot more confident in myself. Cause I think it, it did stem from just me not being confident enough in my own ability and wondering, you know, are they the same competitor they are in competition versus training? Like, did they get stronger since last time I saw them? And when I just write down these questions, I realize that I'm just making assumptions and I'm just, I'm just like indulging my ego here. So, um, just like, 
really making myself super honest and asking the hard questions that I wouldn't admit to anyone otherwise is what gets me down and realize what I'm actually thinking and why I'm thinking it. It's really so interesting because journaling is meditation. You know, it's looking and witnessing your thoughts as a third person and you're honest with yourself if you're doing it right. And it's really interesting that you came to that insight. And I'm, I'm so happy you brought up ego because you mentioned on your website that this is one of the things that that you've changed. You, you used to view ego as something from ego is the enemy, Ryan Holiday, as a, a negative almost. But you've now started to think, at least on your website, about how ego can be used as a positive. And talk to me a little bit about that and, and what you're – your change has been from ego. Yeah, that was a really exciting kind of revelation I had when I was reading um, a book called Overdrive. Um, and Overdrive is just about Formula One and the kind of mindset that Formula One drivers have. As I mentioned, I'm really interested in it. So I obviously bought the book to see a little bit more into the minds of those athletes. And um, yeah, so there was a point where uh, the author mentioned the uh, the fact that Formula One drivers are so n- kind of known for being egotistical because they've got these huge businesses and companies behind them, and they're you know they're driving their fast cars, and they there's so many fans and all that sort of stuff. And the author said um, said something about early drivers, drivers who aren't quite at the higher ranks yet, and how they use ego and really indulge it in order to almost build themselves up a bit and get that confidence to drive against the, like the bigger teams. And in formula one, it's really about uh, how much money your team has, which is a bit unfortunate is not really about like the driver or um, like how skilled you are, how much time you put in the gym. Like if your if your car just can't win races, then it, it, it just can't now. Um, so I brought that back to my, my experience in climbing, like, I'm not quite at the the higher levels in international comp- competitions. I'm struggling to make semifinals at uh, World Cups, and I realize, you know, through meditation and journaling and and just thinking, you know, when I'm at competitions, that the biggest barrier here is the fact that I don't think I belong with the rest of everyone, especially being from Canada. It's not necess- It's not a bad country. I love being from Canada, obviously. Um, but the team, the Canadian team, isn't quite as well known around the world in climbing, especially. And um, being on the Canadian team almost at one point during my career felt like a bit of a disadvantage when it came to competing you know, on the world stage. Because um, we're just known as people who don't make semis and aren't really that big at all. So even wearing the jersey at competitions made me feel like inferior to someone who was wearing a French jersey. And I don't even know that athlete. Um, so it was, it's become like, it was still a problem. Um, I haven't competed because of, uh, the COVID pandemic. I haven't competed since, you know, putting more thought into the ego side of, um, competitions. So I haven't competed since, uh, I think it was 2019. Um, but basically the conclusion was that maybe I should indulge ego a little bit, um, in order to, build up the self-esteem and the the belief in my in my own training and my my skills in the competition round because you know to date I just wasn't feeling like I was strong enough to compete but if I if I indulge that if I go to the gym and I if someone gives me a compliment and I just instead of saying oh no you know I just train a lot or whatever just really owning it and saying thank you like I work really hard and I, I feel like I deserve it mm-hmm. um that's probably not a bad thing. Like, like Ryan holiday and ego is the enemy used to always say like ego is the enemy. And that was the first book I really read on philosophy. And so that was just my whole like world, just ego, stay away from it. But, you know, maybe if you're careful, you could use ego to almost fake it, fake the, the confidence and the, you know, until you, you actually earn the confidence and you have got yourself the competition results that prove to yourself that you have the skills. Yeah, it's such a fine line, right? Because 
you don't want to be overconfident. You don't want to be so confident that you start getting cocky, that you start thinking you're untouch- untouchable. But at the same time, you want to have enough confidence to be able to say, yeah, I worked really hard and I'm going to do my absolute best and that's that's enough and that's worth it. And and so it's uh, it's definitely something to think about, about where you personally and whoever's listening, where you personally fall on the scale of of confidence, cockiness, and and just unconfidence on the other side. So it's just like, and it might be different for different activities, right? Like you might be really confident about rock climbing, but really not confident about doing the dishes. It it's dependent on the person, and it's dependent on the activity. So that's something to keep in mind as well. You have yeah, exactly. Yeah, you have one post that I wanted to talk about loosely related to this that really hit me and and one line in particular really hit me and I'm talking about the champions checklist post and it's something that I'm going to think about for a long time because it could be applied to any field and so you had one one quote in there that I, I kind of just want to like like put on my wall and just you know frame <laughs> it you said a champion is a person not necessarily athlete that embodies hard work commitment and consistency consistently. And I just thought it was so brilliant. And you talk on the the champion's checklist is five things, sleep, diet, downtime, deliberate practice, and professionalism. So talk a little bit about that. Talk a little bit about the champion's checklist and, and what that means to you and how you created that and, and why that came to be. Yeah, that's actually funny. I haven't thought about that post in quite a while. Um, yeah, like again, this kind of ties to the, the chasing excellence kind of ideas where, um, like, again, you don't need to, like being a champion has nothing to do with how you're training. Um, like for example, there's a kid, um, I used to coach a competitive team at my climbing gym and there's one kid on the team who is an absolute champion and that he's actually the one that inspired the post in general. Um, he's not the best athlete or he's, yeah, he's not the best athlete on the gym in the team. Um, he, he's a, he's a little bit below like the other kids his age. Um, I wouldn't say he stands out physically. Um, but he absolutely inspires me whenever I see him do anything. Um, like he works harder than anyone I've ever seen. I actually had to, at the end of one session, I had to point it out to the whole team. I said, today, I actually saw someone work harder than anyone I've ever seen in my life. Um, he was doing pull-ups and he went to pull up and he didn't go anywhere, but he wouldn't like, he wouldn't just accept that he wasn't getting to the top of the pull up. He yelled as loud as like, you could hear it from the other side of the gym and he wasn't going anywhere, but he was yelling and yelling and you could see how hard he was trying in his face um, and his muscles. And he was just pulling and he didn't stop until like, it just became ridiculous how long he was trying to pull up. Wow. And, uh, that it, that really stuck like stuck with me, and I obviously I'm still talking about it today. And every time I see him, I'm always you know wondering what he's doing if I can watch him on something he's climbing um, because he's such an inspiring champion. And that is what it means to be a champion. You know, it's not about you know what you're specifically doing. It's about how hard you try and how much you want it. Um, so in the champions checklist, I'm kind of giving the layout for anyone to be a champion in any facet of their life. Like you don't have to just try hard until your muscles, you know, are completely destroyed. You can, you can try hard at like reading or typing or any, any domain that you're really working on. It's about, you know, how hard you're trying. And, you know, one of the points is deliberate practice and, um, deliberate practice is just, you know, what it means to be good at anything. And that is trying something that you're bad at doing something, with intention and not just, you know, having a random climbing session, you're just climbing, whatever you see, you're actually climbing things that you're going to see in a competition or you're climbing things that, um, you're bad at specifically. You're not just doing whatever. And the same can go with, uh, like reading, for example, you don't want to read just, you know, things that are going to be easy to read. You want to read like Shakespeare or, um, maybe some like Sam Harris or, or, uh, Cal Newport kind of reads, Um, something that will really challenge you and will add value to your life. Um, So yeah, being a champion is, is a lot more than results. It's completely about your mindset and, 
you know, how you go about training or practicing or anything that you're really doing in life. I love it. I love it so much because this is what I think about on a daily basis and hearing someone else who's actually six years younger than me talk about it just fires <laughs> me up because it, it means you're going to, if you just like live by this ethos, like by the time you're my age, oh my God, I, I'm super excited for you. So talk a little bit about like, so you, you've mentioned right now, like Two interesting things. You mentioned coaching with coaching kids rock climbing and also you mentioned that you don't have a coach. So talk about how these things like have influenced you and and just why they are the way they are and and like how coaching's changed your perspective and and also why you don't have a coach. Yeah, that's yeah, from the surface I can see how that seems a bit like contradictory. Um so I definitely I, I think I'm providing a lot of value to the kids I coach um, because I did at one point um, have a coach, of course. Um, when I said that when I started climbing, people were asking me, like, you should join the team. Um, that was one of the most important things I could have done for uh, my climbing because having that first coach to uh, just give me the first view into what structured training looks like and what you know deliberate practice should look like that was all I really needed to um, like get started on my own uh, like programs and designing my own things. Um, where I lost value in having a coach was when they weren't on the same page as me. Um, and up until the point where I won um, youth nationals, so that was about um, like a year and a half of competing, um, it was always, you know, we're still working towards the same thing. We all want to just try and do as well as we can at nationals and we both know how to get there. But as soon as I won nationals, they all of a sudden didn't know what to do with me anymore. They they wanted me to just, you know, keep doing what I was doing, keep the status quo. But I was I was always looking to make, you know, world competitions. And I was looking to actually make something out of myself. Because when I won nationals, I realized that I wanted to actually pursue this seriously. And they weren't really into a serious competitor. They were into like someone who's going to do well at youth nationals, mm -hmm. which was really good, but I, I just wanted a little bit more. And um, I'm forever very, very uh, like grateful for, you know, the, the fundamentals that they gave me and they definitely were what helped me to get to, you know, nationals and win nationals. But um, beyond that, it definitely, I need to take into my own hands because a goal like that needs to be like a 24 seven kind of goal. Like it needs to impact your diet and now you need to work on your sleep. And, uh, they just couldn't go beyond the two sessions a week that we had together. Um, now on the flip side, I feel like I'm kind of starting to do that with the team at my, my local gym. So I'm kind of giving people the fundamentals that I, had when I was, um, just up and coming in climbing. And whenever there's someone who wants to break out, I know what it feels like to want to do that. And I know what it means. And I'm able to have those serious conversations with the athletes, um, about where to go and who to talk to about making their next steps. So, um, it's really motivating for me to kind of talk to people who are in my same shoes, um, currently. And, uh, like, honestly, like the guy that I was talking about, the one athlete, like just seeing all the kids on this team working so hard, like they, they inspire me more than some of my national team, uh, competitors and athletes, mm -hmm. um, because of how, like how much they want it, like they don't have it yet. And they want it like even more than people who already have like national championships behind their belt. Um, so yeah, the main thing there is motivation. Like I wouldn't say I get too much out of like teaching them technique or, showing them exercises. It's all about like the mindset. Like it, it always is about the mindset um, when it comes to coaching and being coached. I love it. And it makes so much sense. And your, your explanation makes so much sense. So, Thank you. so talk about, you mentioned before that you are, you are usually the only female, only girl in the, in the gym. Talk about how that changes your mindset and, and how that has impacted you. Yeah, I think about this from time to time. Like, I wonder if I would be better off if there was someone roughly my age, roughly my category that was always there to push me. Um, but I always think, you know, I've, I've done 
pretty well, like without, like all I've really had is, um, there are a couple, uh, guys on the team. Uh, I think one's three years older than me and the other's four. And they're both really, really good athletes. Um, they, one used to be on the national team and the other is still kind of in the trying to make the national team, uh, boat, but because they're on the men's side, they're very, very talented. And because the men's side is so competitive and there's more competitors and the, the level is just a little bit higher. Um, it makes it very, very competitive. Now, not quite as competitive as, you know, if I saw a female direct competitor climbing something, I'd feel a lot more motivated to, to really get whatever she was do- doing done or, or do better than whatever she's doing. But I think, oh, like more important than having someone directly next to you is having someone to kind of show you like what's possible. Um, having some male competitors with me, um, has definitely been helpful for that. Like they're always, they always seem to be like a little bit ahead of me, um, which I think is good. Um, when there's someone a little bit worse than me, I'd say I, I, it's, I struggle to, to be competitive in that atmosphere. I think like being the smallest person in the room is, is always a good thing to have. And, um, you know, in the interest of indulging ego a little bit there, um, like in Ontario, in my province, there's not a lot of female athletes that can actually challenge me. So, um, I kind of have to reach out to provinces that are, you know, hundreds of kilometers away and they can't be there with me during my training sessions. Um, so having a couple male competitors is really, really good. Um, it gives me, it's just like a, a person, just someone that is doing something better than me. And, uh, that's kind of what motivates me to, to really try hard. Cause trying hard is the only goal every single day. When I walk into the gym, the number one goal is to try as hard as I can. Um, and if I achieve that, then the rest is just gravy. Yeah. I love what you said. And I actually thought about it on my run today when you, I read a post of yours yesterday, which was like, try harder than you can try harder than, than you, than the best of you would er, would try and i thought that was so fascinating because it's like it's like really true like sometimes you want to to just like give it the effort that you've always given it but if you can go a little bit harder that's where the real growth happens that's where you expand yourself and so talk about that breakthrough moment where you tried a little bit harder at least your your stepdad called it a breakthrough moment of when you, yeah. you were, you were uh, doing that climb. So talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So uh, this was back when I was still on the uh, youth team at the local gym. Um, I was on this climb, a climb that I usually try to do. Um, it was a uh, 512 minus. So in climbing, that's, um, that's a pretty decently hard grade. It's kind of just beyond what most people can do. Um, so it's just getting into that. Like you have to like actually be good at climbing to do this. Um, and at the time I wasn't quite a 512 minus climber. Um, I was just a little bit below and usually, you know, I fall once or twice on the climbs, but I get them in the end. But, um, this one time I went up to climb this 512 minus and I got about, you know, three quarters of the way through and I was starting to get tired. And, you know, at this point during the climb, when I start getting tired and it starts getting a little bit harder, this is where, you know, I usually fall. And for whatever reason, when I was climbing at this one time, I was tired, I was pumped, and I looked up at the rest of the climb, and I thought, I am going to finish this. There's no way, like, I don't know what came over me, but I just decided to do it. So um, through this, like, massive pump, I messed up the beta, so I, I went the wrong way, I, um, I clipped something incorrectly, but I just kept powering through, and that was the very first time that I ever actually tried hard. And it was definitely a breakthrough moment. I didn't really realize it at first because I just, on the surface, it just looked like I climbed something hard. You know, I climbed this 512 minus. I've sent 512 minuses before, but I've never climbed one on my very first try. And this was the first try. Um, And I got down and my stepdad was like, oh my gosh, you tried so hard. Like you were clearly about to fall on every single move at the finish there, but you didn't. And I thought, yeah, that's great. But, you know, only now do I kind of realize how important that day was because it takes you 
a way like that's kind of the difference between someone who's on the Canadian national team versus someone who's trying to be on the Canadian national team. People on the national team don't let go of holds. You know, they go for them with the intention and the, the grit and the determination to actually hold on. And that was one of the biggest moments of my early uh, climbing career. And it taught me, you know, what, being good at climbing looks like and what trying hard really looks like. And I'd never felt it before. And when I did feel it, I realized, you know, what it actually means to, to be really good. The difference between someone who's trying to be on the Canadian national team and who is on the Canadian national team, that sentence gave me chills, Madison, because it's like, (laughs) it really is so true. Right. And it's true no matter what, whoever's listening is is trying to do and accomplish in their life. It's like that little bit of extra effort is the difference maker that's going to get you to where you want to go. And that's so powerful and it's so true. And that example is just is so fascinating to me and I, I just it's it's uh, an absolute pleasure to hear hear you speak about it. So one thing that I wanted to talk to you about was a movie that I watched and I'm sure you get this all the time from people who who don't climb and who aren't in the world of climbing. But I watched Free Solo, obviously, with Alex Honnold. Yeah. And and I was like, I was amazed by it. I watched it a year or two ago with my grandfather. And we were just sitting there like in amazement. Is that something you've ever done? And and if you have, what's the experience like? Yeah, so that's very funny. Um, I have actually never seen that movie. Oh, no way. Um, now... Yeah, I, at this point, I probably should because I have heard this quite a few times. Like, like just it's kind of just like what brought climbing into the forefront. Yeah. Um, so I'll say a couple things. First of all, even though I haven't seen it, I absolutely know what it's about. Um, I've been following that athlete for quite a while. Like, he's very, very popular in the climbing world. Um, now I'll say free soloing. It, like, I almost wish that the big movie that brought climbing out of the the dark wasn't about free soloing because most people don't free solo. Um, it's super dangerous. Usually climbers are not that dangerous. Um, and it's just like climbing for me is about going as hard as you can and the climbing the hardest things possible. And, um, what Alex Honnold was doing in the movie was not like, it wasn't the hardest climb possible. Now he probably did it in in the hardest possible way. Um, which is absolutely incredible. Um, like the, like in terms of mental capacity, absolutely insane. Um, like there's no way like I would ever be caught on a climb without a rope. Um, like I barely, like I, a couple years ago, I specialized in just bouldering and bouldering is only up to about 15 feet. So there's always a mat below you and you only go a certain distance. I haven't gone on a rope in two and a half years, um, outside of a week ago, (laughs) Um, but yeah, like it's, it's incredibly terrifying and that is what makes it so impressive. It's not necessarily that the climb is incredibly hard. It is pretty hard. I think it's like a 14 that he was doing. And I was talking about 12s that I was doing in the gym a while back. So it's quite a bit harder. Um, but he's just not pushing the limit of physical capacity. He's maybe pushing the limit of like mental capacity in terms of climbing. Um, now that said, I would definitely consider his feet there, like climbing the nose, um, free solo as probably like the single most impressive sporting achievement. Um, and I think there's quite a few, um, like Twitter, like I I was just looking the other day and I saw on Twitter, someone wrote, you know, what's the most impressive like sporting thing. And then they mentioned his free solo attempt there. Um, but yeah, free soloing is absolutely insane. Um, never done it, never will (laughs) just because I'm a bit of a, competition climber so i don't actually have quite that affinity towards even outdoor climbing um and yeah i just i really i feel a lot better with a rope i have to say (laughs) makes complete sense and and so switching gears a little bit you you mentioned on your website that you're you're looking towards the 2024 olympics and rock climbing is a a new sport in the olympics right is that is Mm -hmm. that correct and and talk a little bit about why that's your goal and and what like what possessed is that just the natural path for you and like and talk a little bit about the olympics and and why that's so important to you and why you mentioned that on the website at least yeah so 
it never used to be that important. Like when climbing first got put into the Olympics, I didn't really care. Um, and that was mostly because of just the Olympics. Like the Olympics is, you know, they've had their fair share of scandals. And um, I never was really one to watch the Olympics anyway. But, you know, being an athlete, um, it's, you know, that's kind of what athletes do. Like, it, yeah, like, like you said, it's kind of like the natural path. And um, it, it adds a certain amount of legitimacy to your career. Um, and it's, it's obviously a huge event. And I think, you know, putting all like the scandals and controversy aside, um, I think the Olympics are an amazing opportunity for an athlete. Um, not even, not even just because of the, like the, the audience and reach of the Olympics, but just because it is like the Olympics, like thinking about the history of it all and, um, the optics of everything. Like, it's just such an amazing event. And, um, so when I heard that 2024, they would, they, uh, they would be splitting the disciplines up. So currently, um, in 2021, if the Olympics happen, um, climbing is supposed to be all three disciplines. So you got speed, um, lead, which is with ropes and boulder all together. So every single athlete needs to do all three of those disciplines in order to win the Olympics. Um, but in 2024, they're going to take speed out and put that as its own discipline with its own medals. And then they're going to have lead and bouldering together and lead and bouldering together. I can do, but I will not put a rope on me and, you know, climb up a wall as fast as I can. Speed climbing is just not, um, it's not really the same as the other two. Like, like I said, I really like just trying as hard as I can. And speed is like a sprint versus a marathon. Mm -hmm. Um, they're completely different. They are, it's always the same speed climb all the way to the top. And it's just, it's a bit more physical than, um, like it's just, it's mostly physical speed climbing. And, uh, I just never had any interest in that. And so when I heard it was in 2020, uh, Olympics, I just thought no way, not doing speed. No, thanks. Um, but Boulder and lead, I definitely would go for, um, I think if I have the opportunity, um, like I, I might as well try for it. Like, it seems like something I'll regret not doing, you know, in 20 years, um, just because of how special, you know, that whole weekend would be um, of competing at the Olympics. And it's just such a cool thing to be able to, to think about and remember. Um, so I thought might as well, it <laughs> seems kind of interesting. And, uh, you know, I, I really, like, I, I like having something really big to think about in the distant future. So, well, I certainly hope I'll be watching on my TV screen in, in 2024. Madison, before I let you go, uh, I, I'm super curious about why uh, you started writing online. A lot of people who listen to this podcast also write online and, and I'm curious like why you're, you're such an incredible writer and also a, a great rock climber. Why did you make that decision to, to start posting your ideas and thoughts on the internet? Yeah. Um, it actually started with one of my sponsors. Um, it, it's called crush climbing. It's out of Tennessee and, um, they have this little blog going and they said, um, when I, when I gave in my little resume to just like tell them about myself, cause there were a bunch of questions I had to answer. And I just gave these big, long paragraphs for every single answer. And the people at crush climbing were like, Hey, we'd love to have you on first of all. And second of all, you clearly love to write. We actually have a blog. Do you want to like contribute to it? And I thought, sure, whatever. That sounds amazing. Um, so I wrote my first blog. It was about philosophy and meditation because that was kind of the big idea that I had at the moment at that time. And, uh, people really liked it. Like a lot of people shared it, um, like just in like my area as well as Tennessee. And it got some really, really good feedback. So I kept going and I, my second post was about social media and it was actually about my departure from social media. And I think it was actually that post that started my personal blog on my website because that post was incredibly popular. Um, not just because of like the amount of people that um, saw it, but because of the quality of responses I got from people. Um, everyone, like I actually influenced like, like a couple, like maybe 10 or 12 people to delete social media after that one went on to their website. So I thought if I'm actually making like this big of a, an impact on people, like 
I think I could keep going with this. So um, it was around that time that my website, madisonfisher.com was going to be taken down because uh, I originally had it as like a, I was trying to raise money for my trip to China um, for climbing. And I hadn't really touched it in like two years. And so um, my stepdad said, hey, your uh, website's about to expire. Do you want to do something with this or do we want to just torch it? And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to turn it into a blog. So I transferred those two posts over to my personal website and I just kept going with it. So that's the little story. Oh, well, I'm certainly grateful for it and I'm sure other people as well. I love reading your work and you guys can find that at madisonfisher.com. Those will be in the show notes at dannymiranda.com. And tell us, is that's the only place people could find you? Do you want people to email you? Tell, tell everyone where they could find you other than madisonfisher.com. Um, well, I, yeah, it's a little bit, a little bit tough. I think it's only going to be madisonfisher.com. Um, you could also find me on, um, like crush climbing's website, crushclimbing.com. Mm -hmm. Um, you'll see my, my other blog post there and you can kind of, you can, it'll trace you back to Madison Fisher in the end. Um, yeah, other than that, I've got my email on my website as well, which I always love, uh, responding to emails. It's really, really cool to hear what people have to say about my ideas and uh, to hear some of their ideas as well. So I'm always really excited to check my email and see if someone has said something interesting for the day. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. It's been an absolute pleasure. I can't wait to follow your journey of life. And, and thanks for joining us today. Yeah, it was awesome. Thank you so much, Danny. That was my conversation with Madison Fisher. If you enjoyed this episode, let me know on Twitter at Hey Danny Miranda. I absolutely love your feedback, positive or negative. Just want to hear what you have to say about the episode. That's all for today, folks. Really appreciate you listening into the final seconds. Really, really, truly appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'll see you guys in the next one.